So hello everyone, welcome to episode 48 of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group Meetup. Uh, my name is Paweł from the Quantum AI Foundation. I'm one of the organizers of this meetup and today we'll host a great speaker, Dr. Balint Kotel from University of Oxford. And Balint will uh, give a lecture, will near-term near quantum computers deliver real advantage? So I believe that all of you are curious what will be the answer. Uh, so that's the agenda for today. So uh, first I will just give a brief uh, introduction and tell you more about uh, our meetups and our partners. And then there will be the lecture, the main point. Uh, and we will be followed by Q&A session. But we've agreed with Balin that we would also like to uh, make this uh, lecture uh, interactive. So there will be some short breaks after uh, the models of the talk. So Balin will tell about it later. Uh, finally, there will be closing remarks and uh, after party, of course, you are invited. Um, so the meeting is organized in cooperation with the British Embassy in Warsaw and UK Science and Innovation Network. We have uh, also our guests from the Embassy, so uh, we are happy that we are collaborating and organizing this meetup uh, together. Uh, and uh, we also thank our strategic partners, uh, Cogit, we also have guests from Cogit, so welcome and thank you for supporting us. Uh, Snarto and Sonovero R&D, we also have guests from Sonovero, welcome and thank you. And we also thank our honorary partners, so there are many of them, uh, they help us in advertising this event. And so, uh, before we go to the lecture of Balint, I would also like to give a brief introduction of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group uh, meetup, because I know that uh, we have some participants who already uh, attended our meetups before, online or uh, on-site before the pandemic. Uh, so everything started in 2018. So in July, I attended a meeting of the London Quantum Computing Meetup, so a similar event in London. And then I started thinking about founding the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, so thanks to this inspiration, uh, we started organizing these meetups in November 2018. It was on the occasion of the anniversary of regaining independence by Poland. And so far, we've organized 48 meetups. And our goal is to strengthen the quantum computing ecosystem, especially here in Poland, by sharing knowledge, building a community of quantum computing enthusiasts and experts, and facilitating collaboration, especially international collaboration as well. That's why we also have, uh, or we also invite speakers from, from other countries as well. Uh, from the beginning of the uh, pandemic in Poland, uh, these meetups were remote only, but this year, uh, we are going back to on-site meetings. And in fact, this is the first on-site event after three years uh, break. So now the plan is to have two, four on-site meetings per year and the rest will be online so that people from other cities or countries uh, can also benefit and participate and build this, uh, build this quantum computing uh, community with us. That's all from my side. So Balint, if you are ready, the floor is yours. And first of all, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thanks for being here with us, and we are looking forward to your talk. Yeah. Yes, thanks very much Pavel, for the very kind introduction. So can you hear me? Is it OK? OK, great. Uh, and yes, as Pavel said, I'd like to make it as informal as possible. So if you have any, th any questions, feel free to interrupt, ask a question. I will occasionally check if you have any questions, and I will try to make it uh, accessible to a general audience. But I'm afraid we need a little bit of, at least uh, a bit of physics knowledge uh, to absorb most of the materials. And later I will show you some more recent results because I was asked to actually give more like a research talk um, about you know, what's the state of the art in the field and, and uh, what we have achieved so far. But if you're not a specialist, then bear with me because uh, there will be some, some generally accessible stuff there course. Uh, and just to set the stage, first of all, what is quantum computing? Why it's interesting? What, what does it even mean? And so people attributed to Richard Feynman, who is, as many of you might know, or maybe all of you know this, he's a very famous physicist who won the Nobel Prize. And in the 80s at a conference, he famously said that if we actually want to simulate nature, then we should give up trying to use classical computers. By classical computers, I mean the computers that we use, for example, my laptop or, or, or our phones are actually 
quite strong computers themselves. But they are really not good for simulating nature. And actually, we need to use quantum mechanical systems to simulate uh, nature itself. And then there is another definition I give you here. It's quantum supremacy, which is a really strange sounding uh, term. But it actually means that um, it's the threshold uh, at which point uh, a quantum computer can perform a computational task that would be otherwise impossible by any means with classical computers. It does not mean it's, it's a useful task or a useful problem that the quantum computer solves. It's just any, any problem. I will show you examples later. And there's another term that I will be using. It's practical quantum advantage. It's now the point at which, at which a quantum computer solves a problem that's relevant for industry or for researchers from, from any other field. And that problem would otherwise be unsolvable by means of classical computing. And of course, many companies now raise to build quantum computers. You might have heard about this. And it's a very complex task to build quantum computers and achieve practical quantum advantage. And I just show four layers of this stack. We obviously need to build hardware. We have to do something about the errors in the hardware. Then we have to build algorithms that run on the quantum computer. And finally, find applications and kind of write quantum code that will uh, solve those application problems. So I'm primarily interested in, in these two uh, layers of, of the stack. But I also collaborate with high hardware uh, experts and also application experts. And I have to say, uh, most of the talk will be about joint works with a group of Professor Simon Benjamin. OK, so what, what is this thing about simulating nature? And why, why is it so hard to simulate nature or quantum mechanics? The reason is that you might know this very well, that uh, computers work in with binary numbers. Uh, the smallest representation unit is, is a bit. Uh, a bit has two values, 0 or 1. These are two classical uh, values of a, of a bit, like a switch turned on or off. If I have two switches, I can have both of them turned on, turned off, or combinations of uh, one turned off and on. So I have four possibilities. Uh, with two bits. But if I go and increase the number of bits, what I see is that I have an increasing number of uh, possibilities of different combinations. Actually, it's an exponentially increasing number of combinations, 2 to the power of n. And these are just classical bits. The big difference in quantum physics is that we can simultaneously have uh, a machine that occupies each and every possible combination with actually different weights different probabilities. And that's why quantum computers are so powerful, because we can simultaneously represent, in some sense, all kinds of inputs uh, for, for a function or a program. And this, this is why we want to build quantum computers. And it's kind of generally believed that the threshold at which we can no longer simulate quantum systems or quantum computers is around 50-ish qubits. So Google have chosen 53 qubits. They built uh, a device. They call it the Sycamore chip. This is how it looks. So the chip itself is tiny. It's just three millimeters large. But we need this big, massive infrastructure. First of all, classical control, a cooling infrastructure to cool it down to extremely low temperatures. But the number of different possibilities for 53 bits is actually this massive, big number. And if we wanted to simulate the Sycamore chip, then we would need this much RAM to exactly simulate the state of that quantum computer. Uh, that's kind of impossible. So Google estimated we need 10,000 10, years with a classical computer to, to perform this task. And they, they only did this in three minutes with a quantum computer. But of course, later, IBM uh, also had a saying in this. And they worked out if, if we use IBM's biggest supercomputer, which is still uh, the biggest supercomputer on Earth, then we could do the computation in just uh, 2.5 days. But it's a massive uh, supercomputer, two basketball courts in size. And if you compare to that, this tiny 3 millimeter size chip, th there is already like uh, astronomical differences between size or energy consumption. That's why we want to build quantum computers. And that's, that's already the past I showed you. It's 2018. Now we have much bigger quantum machines. So. IBM already have 433 qubits, and they announced by the end of this year they, they will have 1,000 qubits. So 
in that sense, we are way beyond uh, the quantum supremacy thresholds, so around 50 qubits. But the problem is that it, it's very clear from already from Google's demonstration that if we increase the number of qubits, so that's the x-axis on this graph, and the y-axis is the fidelity, what's the quality of the quant computation. So if, if the fidelity is 100%, that means it's a perfect computation. But we don't expect that to happen because we have errors in the quantum computer. It's really hard to build a quantum computer because it will be prone to errors. And if you increase the number of qubits, you see that we have actually an exponential decrease in the quality of the computation. And that's a really big issue. And already at 50 qubits, we, we have below 1% fidelity. And there is actually a clear way how to overcome this limitation, and it's quantum error correction. But it's extremely hard to build quantum error corrected uh, computers, quantum computers. But we know if we can build one, uh, that's the fortress of fault tolerance, where we have extremely complex large machines that can correct their own errors. And then we can solve all kinds of problems in physics, chemistry, we could simulate molecules. It would be also very useful for society because we could, for example, do machine learning with these, with these um, complex machines. And that's the aim of all these companies to ultimately build a quantum, an error corrected quantum computer. Uh, but it's very hard to get there. And we see that it will take at least decades, a few decades to, to get to that point. But we know there is actually a lot of interesting territory before reaching uh, fault tolerance. And actually, my talk will be primarily about uh, what interesting uh, use of noisy quantum computers we can have, or we can imagine. And I hope I will convince you that theoretical results in this area. So we don't yet have these machines, but we can assume uh, with pen and paper and work out algorithms for these machines. And we can predict that it's actually a really interesting area here. It's called NISC, uh, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. Before I go on, is there any question about this part? OK, th that was really just the intro. And just to illustrate what NISC is about. So I told you that if we had these very complex error corrected machines, then we could, for example, factor primes in polynomial time. Uh, that's a really impressive result by Shor. But we, if we work out how deep quantum circuits we need for that, that means we need to implement 10 to the 12 gates. And, and that roughly means that we need to keep alive the qubits for four months. And that's essentially impossible. We, I don't believe we will ever have a technology that will physically be able to keep a qubit alive for, for, for months. That's why we need quantum error correction, which, which overcomes this limitation. But for those who don't know what a quantum gate is, roughly speaking, it's an analog of gates from classical electronics. So our computers, just like our... So there have been small, tiny demonstrations of... Few, few qubits, I, I don't even know, actually. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, so the first quantum... So not, not really. So the first uh, demonstrations were using NMRs, nuclear magnetic resonance, back then. And uh, it was kind of a low-hanging fruit that with 5 qubits or 10 qubits they could demonstrate uh, these things. Uh, nowadays it seems that there's a huge gap between practical uh, practically useful shore algorithms and what we can do with the current machines. So people have been focusing on, on other demonstrations, not really Shor's algorithm. Um, okay, so just going back to the gate sequences. So we can think about classical computers as uh, basically implementing a series of gates one after the other. And the quantum computer is kind of an analog of this. And we call the unit of computation a quantum circuit, or actually a quantum gate is the unit. Uh, and if we put together many quantum gates, that's a quantum circuit, and that's how we think about algorithms. And for short algorithm, you need to imagine that I have 10 to the 12 of these small boxes here. But we 
definitely can't do that in the near term. What we can do, though, in the near term is to have shallow, so-called shallow quantum circuits of only like uh, a moderate number of gates. And uh, the, the primary aim is to not do di digital gates, but rather so-called parametrized quantum gates, which is sort of an analog of machine learning. Where, you know, in machine learning, we have um, parametrized neural nets, for example. And it's, it's, it's a direct analog. You can imagine that every box here has its own parameter, and we can tune these parameters. And the main primary aim is to extract information uh, from the quantum circuit by doing measurements. So you know in quantum, quantum uh, physics, when we do a measurement, we destroy the state of the quantum system. And for that reason, we need to repeat the measurements many times and estimate so-called expected values. And these expected values are now a, fun a, function of, are a function of the parameters. And we try to train the parameters so that we find uh, a minimum, for example, of the expected value. And this is directly analogous to machine learning. And this is kind of called quantum machine learning, or it's a model of quantum machine learning. And for that, we need two things. We need error mitigation. We have to somehow mitigate the errors in the gate when we measure the expected values. But it's a much more relaxed condition than quantum error correction. Yes? Uh, sorry, this one? Oh, H is some, some operator. So, you know, in quantum mechanics, we express physical... physical. It is the Hamiltonian in this case. Yes. Uh, if you are simulating, for example, a molecule, it, it is the Hamiltonian of, of, of that molecule. Uh, there are some generaliz generalizations I will show you where it can be just some observable that we make up. Uh, and then there, the second component is we need to train the parameters. So just like in machine learning, it's a really hard problem to, you know, uh, train um, a machine learning model. And so a lot of researchers picked up on these ideas and it just started uh, less than 10 years ago, but it already grew into a really big field. It's called near-term algorithms. And a few years ago, three review papers already appeared on the topic. What is quantum error mitigation? So, first of all, it's something that, that's, that we could refer to as a cheap brother of uh, quantum error correction. We don't even want to correct the errors in the quantum state. Actually, we realize that in, in these near-term algorithms, we only need to measure these expected values with the Hamiltonian inside. Uh, and it's fine if we just mitigate the errors in that expected value, so basically a number that we want to measure. And the simplest possible way we can do that is, uh, was shown, demonstrated in this IBM paper from, from 2019, actually. Yeah, so there are some arguments. If you make some assumptions about the, uh, the type of noise in the gate, then you can show that it's actually very well approximated by an exponential function. Uh, here it was, I think, linear, but you can basically assume the error rate is small enough that the linear appro approximation is good enough. But in general, the assumptions don't really apply. So you never know what the actual curve should be. So that's why it's, uh, th there is no guarantee. As I say here, there are no theoretical guarantees that it will work, or you cannot really uh, put down some error bounds how well it will work. And that is actually why this technique I'm going to show you is, is a major breakthrough, because this is the first um, technique that can actually achieve an exponential suppression of the errors, similar to quantum error correction. Plus, we can prove error bounds, so we can guarantee that whatever noise you have, whatever system you have, we can guarantee that the, the errors are suppressed according to an exponential function. But exponentially in what? So the story start, let, let me start first with this story. So imagine that we had not just a single quantum, noisy quantum computer, but multiple of these. And these cannot communicate with each other during the computation. So we use the quantum computers to do the same computation independently from each other. So kind of preparing copies of the same noisy state. And once the computation is done, we allow some communi quantum communication between the quantum computers. And, and basically, we entangle these copies. And that allows us to measure an expected value sigma with an error 
that's actually bounded by an exponential function of the number of copies. So if I have two copies, I can roughly speaking square the error rate. If I have three copies, I can cube the error rate. And so actually, I put my paper on the archive a few years back, and um, people got really excited about this. But in two weeks, Google have put their paper on the archive, coming up with exactly the same idea. So it was kind of concurrently um, uh, published in, in these two papers. Uh, plus, there is a third paper that actually lays down the theoretical foundations for, for this idea. So if you are interested in these details, do check this, check out all these papers. Just, just giving away the, the, the idea how it works. So you need to know some quantum physics uh, to understand this. But roughly speaking, <clears throat> a noisy quantum state is modeled as a matrix, a density matrix. A pure state is a vector. But in real life, we never have a pure state. But still, the density matrix has eigenvectors. And the eigenvectors are basically pure states. And we can think about a noisy quantum state as the eigenvectors, as pure states, appearing with probability lambda. And so the most likely event, if I have n copies, is that I just have the dominant eigenvector appearing n times as copies. And the most likely event or outcome of a measurement process when I measure the operator sigma is that I just measure the right expected value. But the second most likely event is that one of the, uh, in one of the copies, I have the second uh, dominant, so the second dominant eigenvalue, uh, or sorry, second dominant eigenvector appearing with a probability of the second eigenvalue. And in that case, I illustrate it here. Let's assume that the first one is flipped. So the first one has an error eigenvector, and all the others are the dominant eigenvector. In that case, if we perform the measurement process, we actually measure the wrong measurement outcome. And that's the problem with quantum computers. This, these kinds of outcomes corrupt the measurement process probabilistically. And they don't allow us to exactly determine what, what the ideal expected value would be. But we can actually overcome this with the idea I showed you that if I have the ability to measure the product of sigma times swap, so sigma is the operator I'm interested in, the observable, and swap is simply just swaps the ordering of the registers or the copies of the state. In that case, you can see that I have the error, the error eigenvector on the left. Here I have it on the right because I flipped the ordering between 1 and n. And in that case, you can see that the measurement process is zero. It does not, we don't allow this kind of uh, outcomes to corrupt our measurement process. And in general, basically, if you filter out all possible uh, uh, combinations that break permutation symmetry, we still include errors, but only those errors that uh, respect global permutation symmetry. But that means that I have the, the exact same error eigenvector appearing n times, which is exponentially unlikely. So basically, we effectively suppress the errors according to an exponential function. Uh, no, actually, it's a coherent process where uh, it's actually completely coherent. So what happens is that you measure a probability on an ancilla qubit. And because of the symmetry of the, the, this uh, circuit, we filter out everything that breaks global permutation symmetry. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But otherwise, you don't need to make any other assumption. Of course, so this is independent of short noise. So I'm, I'm saying this because obviously you have some short noise on top of this. Um, but that's just a statistical aspect of it. So the, the estimator, the expected value, um, is what I'm talking about here. So on top of that, we will have short noise, but it's really easy to suppress. We just repeat the measurement process many, many times. And we are guaranteed to convert to that value that I'm, I'm showing there. Uh, any other questions about this part? Yeah. 
So, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, <clears throat> so I showed you that for two copies, the n is just the swap operation. If I have n copies, then it's basically a cyclic permutation operator or something that's isomorphic to a cyclic per permutation. So you can imagine a cogwheel where the cogs are uh, the labels of the registers and we just cyclically permute them. And any kind of permutation of, of, of that form is a valid dn. Okay. Oh, of course, yes. Uh, yeah, just a, a question. So the, the, the probability you, you've written here, so with the lambda, was the thing before the dn, right? So it's, it's related, I think, to that question. So when the dn will act, uh, we might add noise in this process. And is it still OK to assume the density matrix at the end of the preparation in the reasoning? You see what I mean? Yes, yes. So I, if I understand correctly, you mean that what I showed you here is equivalent to assuming that this part of the circuit is noise free. Yeah. And indeed, that's, that's my assumption here. So I only get these bounds, these guarantees, if I assume that this part of the circuit is error free. Okay. And I will, that, that's not the case in practice. Uh, yeah. But there are some arguments we can make that it's a really good uh, approximation to think that this is noise free. First of all, because it's a really shallow circuit. If you compare that to the state preparation circuit, <clears throat> it's like one or two orders of magnitude shallower because doing these swaps is relatively easy. But of course, still, it's a, it's a massive engineering challenge, as so, I'm just about to mention. It, yeah, so just maybe to finish on that, because I, I guess you reason in asymptotic behavior. And the, the little thing that confused me is that while the depth might be small, it acts on n qubits. And so that, that's, that's the thing that conf confused me a little bit in the sense that asymptotically, if, if you, increase, uh, you increase the number of location by n, and so, oh, OK, but ah, yes. so uh, you, you see what I mean? practice, we never think about you know, asymptotic performance of this. In practice, we won't really need more than three or four copies, just because it's so powerful that it's, uh, it suppresses the error sufficiently, that it's, it's below reasonable levels of short noise. So I will cover that in a bit. Uh, so I think this will explain more your questions. <clears throat> because so far, I, I assumed that we can do these for free and error-free. It's definitely not the case. Uh, so it's highly non-trivial to actually do these um, derangement operators or swap operators. And in this paper, we actually worked out what's a really good way of doing this. Um, it's actually a work that's supported by a company called Quantum Motion. I also work part-time for this company. And it's a company that wants to build silicon-based quantum computers. And, you know, we have silicon in our laptops, in our mobile phones. Uh, it's widely available. And it's actually really easy to fabricate these chips uh, in large quant quantities. And if you think about a quantum computer as a quantum core or a QPU, then in silicon, it's really easy to have another quantum core next to it, or yet another. And in fact, we can just have thousands of small quantum computers on a single chips, chip uh, with silicon technology. But how is it useful? It's actually useful in many ways. But if we can build some quantum communication links between them, then it becomes extremely useful. And so the idea I show, showed you is now kind of obvious. We use the different quantum cores as quantum computers that perform the same computation in parallel without any com communication involved. And once the computation is done, we generate these bell pairs between the cores and we use them to teleport the qubits one by one from one location to the other. And then we can implement this swap operation. And in numerical simulations, we can actually see that 99.5% fidelity here with the links, which is not that great. Uh, it's actually pretty bad. But that's already more than enough for this idea to work, for, for this uh, swap operation to work. And of course, in ion traps, so I'm citing this paper here from the Oxford ion trap group, they are actually the third record orders of establishing these links. They can have way better fidelities than what I mentioned. So the technology is already there. We just need, need to scale it up. And the really nice thing, so the reason why it works so well, just roughly speaking, is that the noise in these bell pairs, in the communication channels, 
is actually perfectly mitigated by by this exponential suppression technique. And we actually did some numerical simulations. Uh, it's a relatively small system, six qubits. Since I have two copies plus an ancilla qubit, that means I have to simulate 13 qubits, 13 noisy qubits. And simulating noisy qubits is hard. It requires 26 qubit worth of memory. So that's why we are kind of limited with this size. But I show you what I get for the error in estimating the expected value. And if I don't do any error mitigation, then this, is the, this line tells me what errors I get as a function of how noisy my circuit is. In practice, we will always aim to have this region where we have roughly one error per an entire circuit on average. And so you see, we, we take really significant heat from gate noise. So the dashed line, so the ideal case when I have zero noise in the swap operations, with two copies, I can, roughly speaking, square the error rate. With uh, three copies, I can cube the error rate. So you can see this nice exponential trend if I increase the number of copies. But what happens if I have noise in the swap operations? So these lines show various scenarios where I have noise in the gates, in the swap operation, where I have noise in the bell pairs, in the communication channels. And the, the Maganta line is when I have noise in everything, realistic levels of noise. And in the practically relevant region, you see that it basically makes no difference whether I have noise in the swaps or not. So that's why this approach is really powerful and really, especially because of this robustness. And don't take me for my word. So actually, Google have demonstrated this experimentally. And so in the paper I showed you in my uh, theory paper, I present some proofs that actually the suppression, error suppression gets better if I increase the system size. And, and here this suppression is like a bit more than an order of magnitude or so. Uh, but if I increase the system size, I know it gets better. And Google have actually done uh, an experiment with 20 qubits. And they actually demonstrated 140 fold suppression, which is much better than what I show, show you here with, um, with this numerical simulation. And they did that with, with an actually noisy device. So that's, that's a really impressive result. It only appeared a few months ago. But it's, of course, it's a huge technical challenge. So they have roughly well over 100 researchers um, as authors on that paper. So you can imagine it, it takes years of work for a big team. But I'm pretty confident it will become a standard technique sooner or later that we can just use as a black box technique. Uh, any questions so far? <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, so, so the, the the way I understand is that you you need additional qubit to 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 mitigate, and uh, then you, you you can suppress the error, um, uh, basically by, by by killing the leading order term in in the noise uh, with this swap trick, if I understood correctly. And uh, uh, my, my question is, uh, it, it look, so it's not error correction, but it looks like a little bit error correction in the sense that we have our overhead and uh, we, we, we also kill the leading order term in, in the noise. So are there, for instance, notion of threshold and how, how does the overhead compares basically? Yes. So <coughs> indeed we can compare it to error correction because the simple error mitigation ideas, for example, error extrapolation, require no qubit overhead. So th that's why people thought initially that error mitigation is something that needs no overhead. Error correction is something that needs a huge overhead. So this one is something that's sitting in between, but actually way closer to the NISC, uh, almost no overhead regime. <coughs> because in error correction, we need a factor of a thousand or several thousand uh, qubits of overhead. Whereas here we need two or three. So uh, and we, we are already in a regime where, for example, IBM have 400 qubits, very noisy qubits. We have more qubits than we can use. So we are really happy to dedicate one half of the array of qubits to uh, one copy of the same state, basically half the number of qubits. Even in the Sycomore chip, uh, the experiments they can do are below 20 qubits, even though they have well over 50 qubits now. But, but, but ju ju just to be sure to, to understand, so because uh, in, in terms of, uh, so when we do error correction, mm -hmm. um, theoretically, the scaling are nice. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is the big constant. So 
Yes. Do, 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 so what you mean here is that in terms of scaling low, asymptotic behavior, it looks like the same, but you have better prefactor. Uh, way better if I wanted to summarize. <clears throat> so you can imagine, <clears throat> sorry. So we have some error bounds that look like this. So the error is bounded by Q to the power of N. It is actually a similar bound in error correction, but the prefactor is much worse in error correction and Q is much closer to one. Here Q is actually a small number in practice. So we need, that's why we only need a few copies okay. and not thousands of copies or tens of thousands of copies. There's one more question. So uh, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, of course we have uh, exponential suppression uh, with number of copies of the noise, but also we will have exponential uh, cost in number of shots required for this inertia. And th that's, mm -hmm. are, that's one, uh, that's a major disadvantage uh, compared to quantum error correction because we don't correct errors in the state. We are prone to this exponential accumulation of the errors. There is nothing to do about that in the near term. And that's why I, I actually mentioned here that in practice we will always focus on the regime where we have roughly one error in an entire circuit. If we go beyond that, then the problem starts escalating and we, the accumulation of errors escalates exponentially. So we will have an exponential overhead. But if we are in this regime or below this, then the overhead is not really an issue. But of course, this, this requires engineering because it requires you to have a per gate error rate that's roughly the inverse of the depth of your circuit. Uh, and the second very quick question, uh, I believe that this DN operator again uh, is uh, probably relatively si simple to implement, say, on uh, s the grid topology. But what about uh, heavy hexagonal, hexagonal topology of IBM? I guess that implementing this is much That's more difficult. Yes. So, so Google used a clever trick. If you have two copies, you don't even need to perform the swaps because you can think of the two copies as sitting on top, qubits sitting on top of each other, and they just need to communicate pairwise. And you basically just need to perform a two-qubit gate between these pairs of qubits and just measure in the standard basis. So you get away with that if you have only two, two copies. But if you want to have more copies, then you need to engineer clever architectures like here. That's more complicated. So, so that's not immediate term, it's more like a bit more future term. We don't think this, this, these experiments will be done in the next year or so. It will need more time. Uh, Thank you. Can you. So this is very well suited for ant traps, indeed. Um, reason for that. Sorry. Exactly. So in ion traps, even if you don't have full connectivity, but you have very relaxed conditions on the connectivity. And so that means you are very flexible on, on how, which qubits you can swap with each other. And so in, in my original paper, I actually I was doing some numerical simulations. I was assuming ion traps because they are so great in terms of uh, gate fidelities and in terms of connectivity. But the problem is, in the near term, we are ultimately interested in repeating the measurement many, many times. And ion traps are relatively slow, and so Google and IBM have a great advantage in that they can do the measurement a thousand times faster. Uh, indeed, so you can imagine any state preparation before this. Uh, the only important thing, you can say that, for example, what if this quantum computer is an ion trap. This quantum computer is a, a superconducting qubit device. In principle, it will still work, even though it's, these are different qubits. In principle, I can still entangle them, but they might have different noise models. And it turns out the approach still works if they have different noise models, as long as the dominant eigenvectors are the same. And we, we know in, in practice, they are roughly the same to a very good approximation. So it's kind of re really lucky. Um, scheme. But let me go on to the next one and then I'd be happy to um, answer more questions later uh, because I have two more topics to cover. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that we are, it's reasonable to be optimistic about error mitigation as long as we keep the circuit error rate reasonable, 
then we can determine very precise expected values in a, in a NISC friendly fashion. And so then we can measure the expected values precisely. Then we feed these into a classical computer and train the parameters of the quantum circuit to find the minimum of the energy. Uh, but how useful could be a machine that can, for example, perfectly, that has zero noise, but can implement only shallow circuits with parameterized circuits? Uh, people got really excited about this because it seems like a good idea. It seems just like machine learning that we have this really big system, a uh, quantum system. We can train essentially a neural net based on this. But it turns out it's, it's not that simple. So there are lots of bottlenecks of, uh, and, and actually major roadblocks in this uh, scheme. So first of all, I told you that when we measure the expected value, we measure it from lots of re repetitions. And if you work out just uh, back, on, back of the envelope calculation, how many repetitions I need for a very simple problem, just for a single iteration of, for example, gradient descent, it turns out we, we might need 10 to the 9 circuit repetitions, which is quite a lot. It might take days on a superconducting device, or maybe even weeks. Uh, and we need to repeat that, because the, the scheme assumes that we optimize the parameters. So you might have heard of gradient descent where we basically measure the value of the surface. If we measure how the gradient with respect to this surface, and we try to propagate the parameters such that we find the minimum of that surface. But the really great problem with gradient descent is that <coughs> it can efficiently get us to the minimum, but only to the nearest local minimum. And we never get a guarantee that it's a global minimum. Meaning that I might think that, I f well, I can be sure that I found a minimum. I might think that this is the ground state of my molecule, but I can never be sure that it's actually the ground state, because it might be that there's an other minimum that has lower energy. That's the actual ground state. And it's actually been proven that um, there are exponentially many such local traps in, in the surface of these VQE problems. So, so that's actually a major roadblock. And we have been working really, really hard to, to make the uh, optimization much more uh, efficient. And so I just list here a few papers. Feel free to look this up. There are lots of ideas around, for example, um, using advanced training algorithms, not just simple gradient descent, but uh, gradient descent that takes into account what's the geometry of the quantum state and ideas like that. And this can actually reduce the repetition numbers by a few orders of magnitude. Still, we will be always prone to this exponential number of traps. And there are other issues I haven't even mentioned, for example, barren plateaus, where the surface is almost completely flat everywhere. So basically, we have no hope of even making any progress in the optimization. So in that sense, even if we had a perfect quantum computer working out these expected values, even then, do we really expect to have a quantum advantage? And it turns out, actually, in some cases, we, we can hope for a quantum advantage. And in some cases, we can do clever tricks. So the major bottleneck with, the <coughs> with this VQE idea is that we only measure one, uh, basically, expected value, the energy of the system, of the Hamiltonian. But that's just a single number, and we optimize basically a single number. But the quantum circuits, the quantum state, is an extremely large object with, with lots of information inside it. And we try to reduce it to a single number. And that's where we introduce this major um, bottleneck. And actually, in this paper that I show here, a uh, quite recent paper, we set decide to, well, take lots of uh, information out from the quantum system and try to analyze them simultaneously. So not just a single cost function, let's escape, but 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 8 of these. And we want to simultaneously analyze them. And this is really powerful, but you might say, won't it be 10 to the 8 times more expensive? And actually, in terms of quantum cost, no, it won't. It actually costs almost the same amount of quantum computing resources to determine one surface as to determine 10 to the 8 surfaces, if you do this clever idea. And how do we do that? It sounds like magic. We actually use so-called classical shadows for it. Uh, but just very quickly, if you, if you remember from basic quantum mechanics, we can dis d define <coughs> variances of an operator. So variance of a Hamiltonian is zero if we are in an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian. And the variance is the covariance 
where a equals h. And that's just the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value. So it's kind of an analog of, of the variance from classical statistics. But we can generalize it to covariances, where we don't just have h square here, but any other operator that multiplies h. And we can actually prove that if we are in an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian, then the covariance with respect to any operator must be zero. But we have lots of operators in a qubit system. We actually have four to the power of n uh, different operators in, in, n, in an n qubit system. So that's, that's a lot. In principle, we can set up lots of conditions that we want to satisfy in order to find an eigenstate. And basically, that's what the approach boils down to. We want to find parameters uh, in the circuit where every possible covariance vanishes. And I just rephrase here now, I write the covariances as functions of the circuit parameters. We can measure these, I will show you later how we can measure these. But these will basically span surfaces as a function of the parameters. And we will have many, many different surfaces. We want a condition that each and every surface is exactly zero. Roughly speaking, so here the red dots show where this single surface has zeros, so-called roots. And joint roots, sorry, the blue lines are the roots of this single surface. And the red dots are where we have joint roots of the two surfaces, where we are guaranteed we are in an eigenstate. And <clears throat> essentially, it boils down to a, to a root finding approach. And root finding is a well known problem. It was solved hundreds of years ago by Newton. And you might recall that we find roots uh, in the Newton algorithm by taking the function computing the gradient and approximating the function with a linear function and extrapolating to where it is zero and jumping there and then iteratively repeating this many, many times to ultimately find the root. But if we have many functions and we want to find a simultaneous joint root, then we need a more complicated object. It's called, object. It's called the Jacobian. And so the Jacobian is essentially a matrix of partial derivatives. It's actually really easy to d determine with a quantum computer. So the idea is that we measure the Jacobian, which is a small matrix. Um, actually, if we have 100 parameters, then we will have 100 different partial derivatives. Uh, but this will be actually a really big tall matrix, a non-square matrix. And we invert it, and this way we can iteratively find the roots. But how do, you, how do we measure lots of roots, uh, or sorry, lots of um, covariances and, and their derivatives. And that's, that's where classical shadows come into play. So I don't know if you have heard of classical shadows, but it was a really big deal a few years back when this paper hit the archive um, by the Preskill group. And classical shadows are essentially a, a means of estimating many, many, many properties of a quantum state uh, with very little quantum resources. In fact, what we do in classical shadows is we essentially take our quantum system and instead of directly measuring in the standard basis, as we would do uh, naively, we rather apply a random rotation. Um, this rotation is very simple. These are just single qubit gates, only gates. And then we perform the measurement. But then you might say the measurement outcome are just random numbers. Well, they are random numbers, but they actually and the press kill team proved it. Those random numbers um, contain information about every possible property of the quantum state. In fact, it gives us an estimator of the entire quantum state. And so if we want to determine these covariances I showed you, n of these covariances, we only need to do a logarithmic number of uh, measurement overheads. And that roughly means that if I run my quantum experiment for one day, I determine uh, 1,000 observables. If I run my quantum uh, experiment for two days, instead of 1,000, I determine a million uh, properties of the quantum state. So the Jacob Jacobian will then be 100 by a million, so a matrix of dimension 100 by a million. So it will contain a lot of information. But why is it in good for me to have a lot of information? So this is a numerical demonstration that if I increase the number of constraints, uh, this is now a VQE training, so it's kind of a machine, the outcome of a machine learning training. 
So I show here the infidelity. And if I increase the number of constraints at around 5,000 uh, mm -hmm. different, when, I, when my matrix time column dimension is 5,000, I have a really extremely low infidelity, meaning my training is extremely good. And so in each and every data point, we only used 20 iterations of the new root finding approach. So it is something that's really, really promising. And there are lots of applications of it. We can basically find eigenstates of Hamiltonians. It's a direct analog of phase estimation. It works very similarly to phase estimation. Here's the demonstration for, for a spin problem. And this shows the different energy eigenstates. As you can see, we very quickly converge to, to one of the eigenstates. And the really nice feature of it is actually, I showed you these local traps, which, which are introduced because we are optimizing a single energy surface. So this orange line shows actually a VQE optimization where we get trapped in one of the local traps. And we cannot make any more progress because we are trapped in one of these local traps. But the global minimum is actually far away. But now, if at this point when we know we got trapped, we turn on this root finding approach I showed you, as you can see, we can jump out of the local trap and find the global minimum. Not generally, but in, in, in some cases when we have a sufficient overlap with, with the global optimum. But it shows that it's much more powerful than, than simple VQE. And so, how much time do I have? Okay, great. So maybe one or two more questions and then, or one or two questions and then I'll go on to the next topic, which will be short. Uh, yes, or, yeah. Um, you can, so there are several papers on around these ideas that you can actually use noise. Even one of the papers I, I cited here explores the idea of using noisy elements uh, to improve the performance of the training. Uh, it doesn't fundamentally improve things. Uh, it's a nice trick that might or might not work. Proofs of because there are conventions proof for QAOA, but now from what you have shown, if I hit the local minimum, I mean, I cannot converge, right? You so this... Converge, yes, to local minimum, yes, that's right. Okay, but then if I run a general problem and I didn't know about your method, I don't have a guarantee to converge to... Uh, it depends on what kind of problem you run, so... I mean, if you can uh, comment what problems are known to, to be convergent, I mean, is this known or is this something that people... So you might recall that I defined E as an expected value. And if I define it like that, and theta are actually parameters inside my gate, then VQE is guaranteed to converge. And the reason for that is the surface is guaranteed to be smooth. And the, conver the question about convergence is whether your uh, surface is, is continuous enough or not. Uh, in machine learning, you might have classical machine learning, you might have instances where it's actually not um, smooth enough. But in the quantum case, it's always smooth. Uh, it's, it's because of uh, property of Lie groups. Uh, it's quite technical, I can explain that later. And in the idea I showed you, we determine, uh, it's actually a very good question, so we determine these covariances. In the paper, we actually prove that these are also always smooth functions, as long as the parameters are actual gate parameters. And, and for, for those cases, we know that the Newton approach converges. It was proven like 100 years ago or so. Um, okay, maybe I'll go on to the next topic and then later we can, we can discuss. So, yeah, actually it shows here that oh, we worked really hard to determine eigenstates. All these approaches uh, are based on the idea that we are given a Hamiltonian, we want to find a ground state or an eigenstate. And we, we basically encode problems from machine learning, from optimization into Hamiltonian, and we phrase it as a ground state search. But what if we don't even prepare the ground state? It turns out we can actually still pre uh, determine very, very valuable information without actually preparing those states. But how do we do that? So it's actually a very recent idea, which hit the archive just before Christmas. We call it classical algorithmic shadow spectroscopy. So the main idea is that we can use quantum computers to time evolve a quantum state. And I think everybody who knows about quantum computing will agree with me that 
this is the most natural possible use of a quantum computer to simulate the time evolution. It's, it's proven it can be done efficiently, unlike a ground state search, which can never be actually done generally efficiently. But time evolution is, is efficient with a quantum computer. So if I can time evolve my quantum state, I can measure expected values as a function of time. That's also a very natural thing, very easy to do. If I write down how mathematically an expected value as a function of time looks, it always assumes this form. And here you can see this fully harmonic coefficient components, and the frequency of the harmonic component is the energy difference of the eigenvalues, or the energy uh, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So basically, if I had access to expected values as a function of time, time series, by, by some clever Fourier transforming, I should, I should be able to tell the energy differences. And this expression, this part, is completely independent of what observable I take. Whatever observable you take, always exactly the same frequencies will appear. And so, we, in this paper, we basically propose an approach that still uses classical shadows to determine lots of such observables and figure out the common frequencies in, in these signals. And it will use post-processing time that's linear in the number of, of observables. But it, again, we'll just have a logarithmic uh, overhead in, in terms of the number of uses of the quantum computer. So the idea is shown here. Every time we evolve the system, this is how the signal looks. It's very, very noisy. Uh, we stick these noisy signals into a big matrix. And I will show you later uh, that from, with some clever post-processing, we can determine spectra. And it's exactly the kind of spectra that chemists and physicists are so interested in, and they have devices in the labs uh, that, that record these kinds of spectra. But with a quantum computer, we are way more powerful, because with an error corrected quantum computer, we can perfectly simulate a quantum system. We can determine perfect spectra. And that could be useful, for example, to determine energy gaps um, in, in, in molecules. And in fact, chemists are primarily interested in this, not, not even in determining absolute energies, not even in determining the ground state itself, but rather just to tell what the gap energy is here. So it is a very powerful approach, but let's just give you an idea how it works. So I told you we measure expected values as a function of time. So here we stick this, these into a big matrix. So the column dimension is the time variable, time index. I have in this example 200 time steps. And the other dimension is the, the observable index. For example, I measure the Pauli X operator in qubit 1, Pauli X operator on qubit 2. And here in this example, I measure every possible local Pauli observable. And as you can see, it looks like random numbers, right? It's just noise. The reason for that is in this example, I only use 100 shots. So I have an extreme shot noise uh, on top of my information. But it turns out within this uh, short noise, there is some information embedded, which we can figure out with some correlation analysis. And if I calculate this square matrix, which I can do with classical supercomputers in linear time, which is really like linear time algorithms, then I don't know if you can see it. Uh, can you see that there is some oscillation going on in this matrix, right? And if I take the eigenvectors, dominant eigenvectors of this matrix, and fully transform them, I get very intense peaks. And those peaks exactly tell me the excitation energies in my system. So this is for, for a, um, a spin problem. And it has really nice properties. So you might have heard of Heisenberg scaling. It's the best possible scaling that we can hope for. And the nice thing is that if I increase the number of observables with the classical shadow approach, then I can increase the signal to noise ratio um, according to this polynomial function. So meaning that if I run my com quantum computer for a little bit longer, then I can get better signal-to-noise ratio by, by a lot. But the really nice thing about this approach is that it, we are really worried about gate noise. So I told you we work really hard on error mitigation techniques to overcome gate noise. But in this case, we are extremely lucky because we can prove. It's a really simple proof, actually, in the paper, but it's really powerful. that shows that if I... Use, use a noisy quantum computer, I measure these expected values as a function of time, then 
those time signals actually decompose as a sum of the ideal signal plus some noisy artifact. But the important thing is it's not in a product form or anything like that. It's in a sum form. And that's extremely good for us because here we did some, some really large scale simulations on, on a Hubbard model um, that's relevant in practice. And as you can see, the peaks, if I increase the circuit error rate, I told you in practice we will aim for one. 2.5 is extremely noisy. As you can see, even with extremely noisy circuits, I can still perfectly tell basically the uh, energy excitation gaps. Of course, the catch here is that uh, if I increase the uh, error rate, then the signal intensity drops exponentially uh, and it escalates above 1.0. But if I can guarantee that my quantum computer is not extremely noisy, then despite that noise, I can still perfectly tell what the energy gaps are. So it has lots of applications. So in the paper, we work out uh, how we can use it with near-term NISC machines, how we can use it with uh, early fault-tolerant machines, which we think will emerge in 10, 15 years. And uh, we also work out how we can use it for ultimately fault-tolerant quantum computing it turns out shadow spectroscopy will be super useful in each and every one of these um, evolutionary stages of quantum computing. In the near term, I showed you we can do VQE. Basically, we can prepare states. If I get trapped in a local optimum, I don't find the ground state exactly, but I will have a relatively big overlap with the ground state. So this plot shows the overlap with the different eigenstates. But since I got trapped in, an, in, a, in a local trap, I will have overlaps with other eigenstates, which would be bad for me in the standard VQE setting. But here, it's actually what I want. I want to have overlap with both the first, the, the ground state, and with the first excited state, because that allows me to determine a spectrum where I only have these two peaks present as, as the excitation energies. Uh, so in the early fault tolerance era, where we have kind of um, not great quantum error correcting codes, but kind of very early noisy quantum error correcting codes, we will be able to simulate relatively long time evolutions, but we won't be able to simulate them very precisely because we will be limited by circuit depth. And then we will be prone to algorithmic errors because in a quantum computer we can always just approximately simulate time evolution. But a nice way is, or a nice uh, use of this approach is to actually mitigate the algorithmic errors, which we cannot do otherwise. We cannot do with any other quantum algorithm. So the idea is that we measure the peak positions, and then we extrapolate, uh, well, as a, as a function of different uh, trotter times. So that, that's how, how large time steps I do, I simulate. So it's kind of a parameter of approximation. I have no access here, because I haven't, still have a noisy quantum computer, but I can just extrapolate back to what happens if I had a zero DT time integration parameter. And I'd like to close, and then later you will be able to ask questions. I'd like to close by showing you that actually there is hope for uh, quantum advantage, and especially with local Hamiltonians. So I, I didn't mention this before, but classical shadows are, are mostly useful for local Hamiltonians. And there are actually lots of important problems that can be posed as Hamiltonians with local Pauli's, such as spin problems, uh, problems in condensed matter theory. But even in binary optimization, we have local Hamiltonians. In that case, we are actually guaranteed we have no so-called barren plateaus, which is great. We can, we can use shallow quantum circuits with only local connectivity. So it's great, for example, for IBM and, and Google devices. And we can also use this, this beautiful um, machinery of, of uh, classical shadows. And for example, the covariance root finding approach I showed you. Uh, the contrary is that still in VQE, we have exponentially many traps. Uh, but with Kovar, I showed you, that we can actually mitigate those issues. And in that case, we are quite uh, optimistic that we should be able to achieve um, at least some form of practical advantage in the near term. But of course, there are so-called non-local Hamiltonians. And they are very useful in applications such as in quantum chemistry. fermi hubbard model is very relevant for, for magnetism. But the problem is that, um, well, the pro is that there are many applications where they come up. There are some forms of classical shadows that we can apply to these problems. 
but the big contra is that we, we will have um, barren plateaus in BQE. We will have um, highly non-local quantum circuits, so they are not great for IBM and Google devices. And they are generally tough to simulate. But still, we can identify problems. For example, the Fermi Hubbard, that's better than others. So for the Fermi Hubbard is still much easier than a general quantum chemistry problem. So we really hope that we could achieve some form of advantage with uh, simulating either some Fermi Hubbard model or some models that are related to it. So in that sense, I think it's quite reasonable to expect an advantage in the near term. To me, the more exciting era is not the NISC early advantage, but more like when we will have uh, some form of early error correction. I showed you a potential application there that will be really uh, uh, enabling for lots of technologies in material science, in chemistry, and so on. And of course, in, the, in, in a few decades, we might have uh, fully fault tolerant machines, but let's see how, how that works out. And actually just wanted to advertise that our group in Oxford develops the, the fastest uh, open source quantum emulator. It's called Quest, and it runs in C. And there is a, a mathematical front end to it. So if you're into quantum computers and emulation, do, do feel free to check this out. And thanks very much. OK, great. Thank you, Balin. Thanks for this great talk. And it's time for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a, still a question on the first part of the, the, the technique to mitigate errors. Um, uh, I w at some point, you said uh, at an earlier question that you still need uh, an exponential overhead in the number of repetitions. Uh, in error mitigation, yes. In yeah, so uh, c can you uh, explain? Uh, yeah, so uh, the thing that I'm confused by is that you apply your method, you exponentially kill the, the let's say, the leading order of the noise. Uh, and so then why do you, do, you, do you still need an exponential overhead in the number of repetition? The reason for that is um, the probability that we will see the dominant eigenvector in an experiment is lambda. But lambda is basically the fidelity with respect to the ideal computation. And I show that here. It's, it's actually an exp experimental demonstration. As you increase the number of qubits, you increase the number of gates. And that yeah. degrades your fidelity exponentially. And that's why... Yeah, but that, that's without... This understand if we do not apply the, the, the mitigation technique. But if we apply you, what you propose, doesn't it remove that issue? That's the thing I did not understand. Okay, so what happens is that um, I will still measure... Well, Imagine this, that we have access to this one, this measurement outcome with this probability. But we are measuring this on an ancilla qubit uh, as a probability in an ancilla qubit. And if the probability that this happens is exponentially small, that means I need to repeat the measurement process exponentially many more times to suppress short noise. Okay. So it's kind of like um, a coin flip. So if I have a really big bias in my coin, like 60 to 40%, then a few few repetitions is enough to tell that it's 50 to 40. But if that bias goes down exponentially and it becomes just 0.000% difference or 0.001% difference between heads or tails, then I need to repeat it many, many times. Oh, okay, so maybe a, a last question to conclude on this. So you, you can kill the leading order term of the density matrix, which guarantees you that if you did an infinite number of runs to your experiment, you yeah. will get close to the ideal value. That's, that's but right. in yes, practice, yes. In, in practice, you have short noise. Yeah, but in practice, so, okay, yeah. so, and, and yeah, okay. And that's why you said before that with error correction, we will not have this problem because with error correction in practice, yes, with so a- you keep the fidelity at 1.0. Yeah, okay, okay, I understand, thank you. Uh, Great, you have more questions? Yeah, so I have a small question about this D-Lambda operator. So mm -hmm. from what I understand, as you said, that it's simple, but when you have two systems of 20 qubits, it's like 20 swaps, right? I mean, you have to change the whole system mm -hmm. with itself. So I would imagine that it's actually complicated, but... 
Uh, for for many systems, is it? Yes, is so it's not trivial in the near term. Definitely, that's why Google opts for this idea where you have just only two copies. Uh, it simplifies a lot. But that's why I was uh, showing you these specific architectures. So in this case, it's obviously 20 swaps, but at the sa same time, it's 20 users of a communication link. And it's actually, arguably, it's easier to do a swap between two local qubits than using a communication line and teleport one qubit from here to here. So uh, there is obviously some complexity involved in it, but it turns out that complexity is much smaller than doing an actual computation on 50 or 100 qubits. If you compare the number of gates in this register to, for example, to solve the Hubbard model on 50 qubits, uh, you will roughly need, uh, I think, 20,000 two-qubit gates. Uh, so there is a paper that estimates resources. But you only need 50 swaps. So 50 versus 20,000 is, you know, not really close. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Do we have more questions? Maybe on the last part, could you comment, because to get the spikes when you show yeah. the different things, you, you do, I presume you, you put randomness somewhere, so randomness is in the observables. Yes. So, yes. so so you, how would you sample from the observables, I guess it's... So it's basically what you do, you use the classical shadows approach. But then you do some kind of har, har a random it set. It is random, yes. Um, so okay. what we do, we time evolve the quantum state, at every time, at every point in time, we run this procedure where we repeat many, many randomized measurements and store the outcome of the measurements classically. If I do 100 measurements, like in this example, that means I store 100 times some bit strings that give me the outcomes on the, the measurement outcomes on the individual qubits. And from, from these 100 bit strings that I store classically, uh, on that, I can run my classical supercomputer to determine a lot of information about correlations. Sure, but my question is, can I be smarter? No, because now I change the rules of the game. I focus on particular task, which is as distinguishing two frequencies. So maybe yeah. there's a set of me observables that I should sample from that will give me the Specifically sample from local poly uh, strings. The reasons, reason for that, that's what we can do efficiently with, with shadows. Okay. In this example, it's all three local Pauli strings, which means that um, X, Y, or Z operators only act on three qubits at once, mm. and they act as identity on every other qubit. And actually, in the paper, we show some proofs that in, in problems of practical interest, we need only determine local observables because they give, give us all the dominant information about these fre frequencies. So we are kind of lucky. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes, yes. Uh, so, so there are different trade-offs, right? So, so this one is actually ideal because I, I told you ion traps are relatively slow. So we either need lots of ion traps, for example, a thousand ion traps running in parallel, uh, could do me a thousand times faster measurements because uh, it's it's fully parallelized. It, it, uh, yes, well, you can have, let's say, 50 ions. That's what they say, that's what the experimentalists say. But the nice thing here is that even if you have just a sim single slow ion trap, you need only 100 shots per um, per time step. And if you calculate that even with a slow ion trap, that only takes you five seconds or so. So that's, not, that's, that's very good. So 100 shots is orders of magnitude less than what you need in VQE. I showed you the number 10 to the 9. You won't do that with ion traps because it just it will take forever. But that, that's why it's um, such an interesting approach because you, you you need very little number of shots to to actually gain some interesting info from the quantum state, the, or actually about the Hamiltonian. Right. Uh, why you decided to use the Hubbard model to calculate the time evolution? Um, so, 
hammer that is it's one of the low hanging fruits in in near term quantum computing so the reason for that is it's very important for material scientists because um for example it's a model for for uh, magnetism for for superconductivity and lots of people want to solve the hubbard model to find the ground state to find uh gaps and um draw the phase diagram, but they cannot do that classically because it's it's a highly correlated system. Classical approximations fail. I think the largest simulations are on the order of 20 qubits or so, 20, 30 qubits. And approximations beyond that completely fail. So we need quantum computers. It's, it's a bit um, more difficult to implement this on a quantum computer than, for example, low-cost beam problems. But still, the Hubbard model is the most convenient of the fermionic problems because you can exploit some some clever tricks to make it much more efficient than the general quantum chemistry problem so the trick is that you constantly move the qubits around with uh, swap networks so that the so-called hoppy fermionic hopping terms always become nearest neighbor and so then you can apply time of evolution gates so that's why here we choose uh, this one is a Fermi Hubbard model, and this one is a Fermi Hubbard model too. All right, do we have more questions? Maybe I will add that I heard that uh, the food is already here, so in fact in the kitchen, so uh, you can also take it into account. Uh, Balint will also stay with us, so be available during the networking party. Okay, thank you. Thank you.